Don is, um, you know, I always view him as a, as a pioneer in Atlanta's growth of supply chain city. You know, with his forming of uh, Tax Logistics a number of years ago, I know there's some Tax alumni here. Um, uh, that coupled with uh, other faculty's interests in warehousing and operations research combined. More and more companies um, uh, grew in the supply chain space here. So we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Ratliff today. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ratliff. Thank you, Jim. Am I on, Andy? Okay. It's a pleasure to be back again. I've given lots of lectures around here, and but not lately, so I'm not... Uh, don't know if I'm still used to it or not. We'll have to give me a chance to warm up and practice a little bit, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, uh, last mile delivery. I've been working on last mile delivery. I, uh, uh, Caps Logistics uh, released its first uh, software uh, in 1980, the first uh, uh, delivery software, so routing software. So. Uh, I've been at it a long time. Uh, I, I guess that means I now know a lot. It certainly means I'm persistent. Uh, I uh, am about to launch a new company called Delivery Dynamics. And uh, so I thought that I was invited to speak that I would talk about uh, why anybody would want to launch a new company in this area, given that there are at least 100 companies in this area that sell uh, uh, last mile delivery software. So uh, I'm going to explain a little bit to you about the why, and uh, then I'll try to give you an idea of what the software is like. Uh, I've been working uh, with a software team for about four years now. Uh, software is harder to build than it used to be. Uh, not much software is built in your garage anymore, uh, so it takes some effort to do it, but we've uh, uh, got it done. Uh, we're in final testing with most of it now, and so we will uh, launch the company uh, sometime after the first year. Uh, okay. Um, I was told that there were going to be a lot of students here, so I thought, okay, I better start with... Uh, a more academic picture, right? Here's my, here's my academic picture. Uh, the delivery planning problem from sort of an academic point of view is you've got a whole bunch of customers out there. And every day there is some subset of, that, of those customers that need to get deliveries. So you've got deliveries to a subset, not all of them, but a subset. And what you have to do is from those, you have to take that subset and then you have to group that subset into groups that'll fit on a truck, and then you have to sequence the, the deliveries on the truck, right? So the problem is a very simple one to at least to talk about. Uh, the results have to satisfy a, typically a lot of delivery constraints. They have to actually fit on the truck. Uh, they have to get to the customer at whatever time the customer, at least when they're open, Right, when they're available to receive it. So there's a variety of constraints, so it has to satisfy those. Uh, it, it needs to be efficient, and it should make the customer happy. Uh, the hardest thing always is making the customer happy. Uh, it used to be the case that we only worried about the uh, trying to be efficient, but now making the customer happy if you're in the last mile delivery business is probably more important than being efficient. All right, uh, this problem from an academic standpoint is, is difficult. Uh, if you had 200 customers, which is a very, very small problem, by the way, 200 customers and 10 trucks, then there are about, according to my calculation, 55 trillion groupings, all right? And then each one of those groupings you have the problem of developing the sequence, which is a very famous problem called the traveling salesman problem. Okay? 
And so there are, for each one of those, uh, about 2,400 trillion possible sequences. So I don't know what big means, but there, there are a bunch of possibilities. And so what that means, in addition to there being a very, very large number of possibilities, we don't have any mathematics, which is terribly helpful in, in getting us to filter through that set of, of huge number of possibilities to pick out the good one, right? So it, it is impossible to generate uh, delivery routes that you can prove are optimal. It's just not possible. We talk about optimizing delivery routes, and but if you look at it from strictly an academic point of view, it's not possible. Not only that, it's not possible now, but it will never be possible. We will never ever be able to do it. And you will never ever in your lifetime be able to go through that number of possibilities to look at them. It can't be done, all right? All right, so when people talk about a route optimizer, basically what it means is that they have tried to combine uh, computer processing, the ability to enumerate possibilities with ideas, concepts from optimization. And so if you have better concepts for which solutions to look at, that helps. And if you're able to look at lots of them, that helps. So what we do is we use parallel processing to look at lots of them. Now, lots of them means typically millions. But millions is a teeny little fraction of the trillions of possible solutions, right? Now, what the good news is that all of all of these solutions, there are typically a lot of them that are pretty good. So uh, while it is impossible to prove you have the best one, if you are clever about how you do it and you look at a very large number, we generally are able to, to get a good one. And in fact, we have a route optimizer which looks and acts like any other optimization engine. Right? So you would, you would be hard pressed to tell that it wasn't actually getting you the best solution. Having said that, the only way anybody can evaluate how good an optimization, if, if I say I've got one and she says she has one optimization engine, the only way you can tell which one is better is you've got to actually look at it. You've got to compare what it does in your environment with what mine does and what hers does, right? Now, having said all that, the thing is in delivery, this is not the hard problem. In fact, you could argue that this is the easier part of delivery. All of the stuff which sort of theoretically is not solvable. The biggest problem in delivery is that the environment is continually changing. Delivery environments do not stay the same. They don't even stay the same over the same day. And there's lots of reasons that change. Uh, one of the big things, the bigger things that's happened is we have an increasing number of urban deliveries. People are moving to cities and people in cities want deliveries to themselves. But it's also the case that they want uh, deliveries to businesses that they frequent. And as you get into big cities, particularly in developing countries, countries like Panama and Peru, the retail is largely made up of small stores. There's not a lot of Walmarts and uh, Targets and the huge big box stores. There's a lot of little bitty stores. In Peru, 80% of all retail is done in the little mom and pop stores, right? So the thing about little mom and pop stores is that's what you can have in cities. They have a small footprint. If they have a small footprint, that says they get lots of deliveries because there's no room to put a lot of stuff. They don't have a big back room to store stuff, right? So it means that we have 
in many cases, smaller deliveries, even when we're delivering to stores. Uh, traffic patterns are continually changing, right? So the time it takes me to get from here to my house uh, will not be the same going back today as it was the last time I was down here. Parking availability is becoming a huge problem in cities. Uh, you, uh, this is uh, over here the FedEx truck. Uh, it was an article in uh, uh, the New York Times. If you hadn't read it, it's a pretty nice article about uh, what's happened in uh, Manhattan. So that picture is taken in Manhattan. And so there's no place to park. And uh, the people like FedEx and UPS and anybody else that goes there, they park in the street. Not legal. They park in the street. And they get tickets. And they pay millions of dollars in fines every year for the tickets. In fact, in some cases, they make a deal with the city that says, we'll just pay you a fixed amount. We won't have to get tickets, right? Which is parking the street. Uh, governments. Uh, governments uh, want to put restrictions on things to make it better for other people other than trucks. So they do things like restrict usage of streets. Uh, in Peru, they've just passed uh, a new set of regulations that restrict the main highways so that trucks can't be on them during certain parts of the day, right? Well, the problem, the delivery problem was complicated before. Now it's way more complicated because you can't be on that road during certain parts of the day. Uh, customers. The Amazons of the world have dramatically changed customer expectations. Now then, uh, uh, customers expect to get stuff, in many cases, the same day, and many times within a very small time frame. So you say, okay, I want it between one and three, and I want it today, all right? So uh, customers continue to change, and the fact that Amazon offers it makes a lot of other people who are not buying from Amazon think they should get better service as well. There's not much time for planning. Uh, now, people order or do something to, to let the, the provider know they want to buy something. And then they want it soon. So you have a very short time to plan. So it's not like it was when I first got in this business where, you know, you'd have a week or a month to plan. Now you've got an hour, two hours to plan. Labor is, continues to be more expensive. And that's the labor to drive the truck, the labor to sell the product, but also the, la the, the labor to plan. Planning labor is the most expensive kind of labor. So if you have some of you that want to go and work for a company that has technology that's going to be used to plan, uh, you don't want to work cheap, right? You also don't like to work at night, so you want to charge them more. So that's a problem. Delivers are smaller for a lot of reasons. One of the things that's impacted things a lot is that the, the stop time to drive time ratio has gotten bigger. What that means is that, that trucks are stopped more than they're driving. And in fact, if you look at the, the I meant to say when I first started to point out what the stem is, the stem the stem, we talk about the stem. The stem is the, the part of the route that's from the DC to the first customer and from the last customer back to the DC. All right, so we call that thing the stem. Now, the stem, there's no optimization, essentially no optimization, to what you do for the stem part, right? So I know I'm going from here, from here to there, and so I can get on Google and say, hey, Google, tell me the best way to get from here to there, right? So there's, there's not much you can do about the stem part. If you look at the, the other part, the, the, the whole driving for most of the city routes, driving accounts for something in the 20% or less of the day's work, all right? Now, if you take 40% uh, 40, 40 or less, and half of that generally is in the stem. So you get 20% or less that's in the part where sequencing matters. So that says that all of this traveling salesman stuff is working on 20% of the problem. So if you're able to decrease 
the sequence by, say, 10%, you've only impacted the solution by 2% because it's only 20% of what you do, right? So it says, okay, all this technology that we worked so hard to do, uh, that part is not the important part. Uh, there's a lot of other sort of innovative things that people have had to do. Uh, one is uh, what are called satellite delivery points. Um, uh, again, I just got back from Peru, so I know what they're trying to do in Lima. But uh, uh, Coca-Cola in Lima, uh, they have a truck, and the truck has a great big cab on it. And this truck goes down the street, and it will stop. And there are five guys that are just riding in this cab. They all spill out while the truck stopped, and they all grab their trucks, hand trucks, and go and deliver their product to five different sets of stores, and they all get back on the truck, right? Well, this makes things appreciably harder if you're trying to figure out how you're going to do your routing and that sort of thing. So you might ask, okay, what's wrong with, with current delivery management? We've spent a huge amount of time on technology to do this. Why is it that this stuff doesn't work as well as it should? Well, one of the things is that technology it puts too much emphasis on the pieces. Uh, this is a problem, perhaps a fatal problem for operations research generally in that operations research tends to pick out some part of a great big problem and put a lot of effort on that part. In some cases, you can do that part quite well, but in order to solve the problem, you gotta do everything, right? So one of the problems is if you go out and you buy a routing software, generally you got a piece of routing software and it doesn't hook up to much of anything else. You have to, you have to make the hookup happen. So if you get uh, a technology that is going to provide you visibility, provide you some visibility, but it usually doesn't do much for your routing technology, right? So you've got all these individual pieces, and they don't hang together much. Uh, planners, probably the biggest problem is that planners assume that typically that the data is good enough, all right? This is good enough beta, I'll chunk it in this fancy optimization scheme I've got, and out will come the answers, right? And I'll show you, tell you Bohr, but show you, that the data is, is typically not good. And just think about, uh, there, there's some data that is pretty critical. W one piece of data that is really critical is, where is the customer? If I get the customer wrong, if I say the customer is over there, computer thinks it's over there, and it's over there, I'm not gonna have a good result. Nothing good is gonna happen with that, right? If I say that it's gonna take me 20 minutes, and it's really gonna take me 60 minutes, nothing good's gonna happen with that. So no matter how good the technology is, if the data is not good, it doesn't work. And generally, the technology does very little to help you with the data. You can look at the answers and sometimes, if they're sufficiently poor, you can say, okay, something is screwed up in the data. But it, the, the technology doesn't try to make it better for you, to make it easier for you. Uh, it, it still takes a lot of manual effort. When, when in, in the 1980s, when we uh, started CAPS Logistics, all of the technology was really about going from uh, doing this on a map on the wall to doing it in a map on a computer. And the map on the computer is still the main way that routing is done. If you look at the technologies, the, some of the more, uh, the most popular ones, they still require a huge amount of human interaction to make it work. You can't just take the answer and make it work. So this is not only expensive, but it results in routes that are not very good, delivery plans that are not very good. Uh, it, it also is not very systematic. Everybody does their own thing. So you go in and, you know, this guy thinks he's really slick and she thinks she's really good and everybody does their own thing and you get answers. And so 
Tomorrow, if you say, okay, I want to do better, uh, you don't have anything that's systematic to do better. One of the things about industrial engineering that we know is sort of the more systematic, the more the same, the more standard it is, the easier it is for us to make it better. And we have done very little in delivery planning to make it better. Uh, we, we assume that there is no variability or uncertainty. That is, when you plug this stuff into the model, you say, ah, it's going to take 22.3 minutes to get from there to there. We know it's not going to take 22.3 minutes, right? That's for sure it's not going to take that. But we assume there is no variability, and we assume there is no uncertainty. And there's really not much in the technology that helps you if you recognize that it's uncertain, there's not much you can do to fix it. Too many times people consider this to be a static environment. There's an inclination to come in, put effort on installing the technology, trying to get it so that it at least looks right, and then assuming that it just is going to stay that way. And if you think about it a little bit, you know that's wrong. You know the customers are going to change, you know the, the traffic patterns are going to change. You know that what happens at the customers are going to change. We've had a, a big flurry of mobile technology that's come in, uh, mostly on cell phones. So now we can do a lot of tracking of things on cell phones. And this is really pretty technology because you can see uh, on the big screen, you can see where all your trucks are and they're all sort of running around but it hasn't done much to help the planning process. It looks pretty, it's sold pretty well, people feel better knowing where they're, all their trucks are, but other than feel good, there's not been a lot of other things that it's done so far. And the last one is that companies, even big companies, generally don't have the capability for do-it-yourself delivery software. It just takes skill sets that they don't have, right? So, we have problems. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And the, the, the thing is that we, we need to have a, an approach that's different. And the fact is, we've learned a lot in, in industrial engineering over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, the one thing that we've learned, we should have learned, is that continual improvement is the way that you should run almost everything. And so it, you can look at, it, it was sort of a core part of the whole quality movement. When you look at uh, uh, things like Six Sigma, uh, it is a core part of that. So this idea of, of doing something and then keep cycling around is obviously the way to go. So then the question is, okay, can you use this idea in delivery planning? Well, the closest that I could find to somebody who had tried to do this, there is a, a, an area which is called adaptive management. And uh, it, it's mostly used in uh, uh, trying to manage natural resources, uh, forests, uh, fisheries, uh, those kind of things. Things which, for which there is a lot of uncertainty. And it uses, base, does basically the same thing, it's just a little bit different context. So I said, okay, uh, this is not rocket science, so I'm sure I can figure out at least what I want to do. So here's what I think you should do. What you should do and how you do it are two completely different things, right? So this is what you should do. Uh, the first thing is to have a, a data hub. I, I, I guess I didn't say to start with, but uh, everything I'm talking about is, are, are, are things that are, have been enabled by what we can do in the cloud now, right? So nice thing about the cloud, we can just send everything up. We can do all the computing up here in the ether somewhere and we can send all the answers back down and we don't have to worry about it, right? So all the data and everything can be done, no question that we can do it, and we can have about as much computing as we want. So 
the, in, in logistics, we've always had a problem in getting all the data in the right place. And so a data hub is critical to bring everything that you need into the same place. So you want to bring it into the same place, you want to organize it, and then you want to use it for both planning and for keeping up with how well you're doing. Organizing is a much, much bigger deal than you might think. Uh, and in, in many cases, people don't really think through what they're doing when they organize the data. For example, uh, if you want to compare, if you think, okay, one of the things I'm going to want to do is I want to compare whether that truck driver is doing a better job than that truck driver. If I want to know that, I'm looking at two different drivers that are doing different things every day. This one's got one route, this one's got another route. But all of the stuff that they have is somewhat different. So if I want to compare them, I have to have some way of figuring out which ones of those things they're doing are the same. And so if it's the case that, for example, I have uh, uh, 5,000 7-Elevens, if I identify all the 7-Eleven stores, you think, okay, I should have that. But in many cases, you don't. I identify all the 7-Eleven stores, and then when I get through, I'll look and see how long it took for 7-Eleven stores that had this, about this amount of stuff. So people that are doing things that are the same. So this, again, not rocket science, but it is also not easy. It takes more than the average smarts to get it organized in the right way. So first is to get all the data. Second, the mobile devices. The mobile devices, uh, while people talk about them mostly in terms of giving you visibility, their real value is as a data capture device. Uh, we talk about the Internet of Things, and the thing that is most important is the cell phone. Uh, the cell phone is a little computer. It has the ability to capture GPS, so I can know where the vehicle was every second if I want, but typically I look maybe every 10 seconds or so. When I go in to make a delivery, I can indicate on the cell phone what I delivered. I can indicate what the problems are, so I can capture a lot of data. So it's a data capture device that gives me information about what's going on right now, but more importantly, data that I can use to analyze sort of how well I've done. And then there's the ability to apply data science. Now, data science is a fancy word that we've done data science pretty much my whole career, uh, yeah, all it means is, you know, you're, you're trying to be smart about the way you do deal with data. And there's a lot of things from being able to clean the data to being able to use machine learning to do things, right? Uh, but it is the case that if you're systematic, you can do things to clean up the data. First thing is to try to make sure that data is right. If you don't make sure the data is right, Everything you do is garbage. All right. And it is not easy, not easy to figure out if the data is right. So use data science to, to help you clean up the data and to help you to, to get better planning estimates. Again, the cloud is a big plus for this because we can store huge amounts of data. We used to only can have a little bit of data about customers. Now we can have lots of data about customers question is how we're going to use it. And then there's the, the, the issue of identifying the problems and inefficiencies. So we can do that both automatically on a computer, in theory, and by various kinds of data visualization. All right? So we can figure out at least where the problems and inefficiencies are. Now, it may be that the problem is it is taking too long at each one of the stores. So that's not a computer problem, that's a people problem. But if it's taken too long at each one of the stores, then you say, okay, there's where the problem is. So what I have to do is I have to go and look and see if I have the right processes, if I've standardized the processes, if people are doing this efficiently, so all of those kind of things. So everything is not technology, but it's still something you have to do. Then once you've done that, what you want to do is you want to adapt the framework and parameters. 
it doesn't make any sense if you're running a thousand trucks a day to have people looking at a thousand routes a day trying to make them better. That is nonsensical. What should happen is that your people ought to be looking at how you're generating the thousand routes a day and they ought to be working to make the thousand routes be good if they're automatically generated. So you should work on the process, not on the final product. If you work on the process, then you've got something that is repeatable that you can do something about. All right. So that is maybe the hardest thing in all of this. Of all these boxes, that may be the hardest one. Is okay. I'm now. You, you see uh, a, a lot of the the newer technology now will tell you here is your plan, and here is how much you miss the plan. Well, that's all fine, but it's pretty much useless unless somehow from that you can figure out how to plan better tomorrow. The fact that I was off by 40% today, okay, it makes me feel bad. But I need to have some way of saying, okay, I got to do better tomorrow, right? So the adapting is, what are you going to do to make it better tomorrow? And then to be able to automatically optimize, and by again, optimize, I mean, Try to get a good one. Delivery plans. All right. So, and then it, everything sort of starts over. You just keep at it. So you start, and then whatever changes you make, you try to make little changes, not big changes. Little changes, try to see what the impact is, and you try to continually improve. That's the fundamental notion. Out of that, you can hook on business intelligence to the data hub. And you can hook on a variety of things that makes you look better to your customer. You can uh, know what your expected time of arrival is at the customer. You can send them messages. You can do what Uber does, allow them to track the trucks. All of this is technology that's, that's doable. And then on that side, uh, in looking at the, how you identify the problems, you've got two big buckets of stuff. One is analytics, and that's the bucket you like the best because most of the analytics, the computer's going to do for you. The computer's going to go in there and try to figure out what the problem is. Visualization, you've got to figure out what the problem is. Now, in some cases, visualization is the only thing you got, right? You, you can't get smart enough to make the computer do it. You're always working toward making the computer take a bigger part of that. So you always want the top one to be bigger and the bottom one to shrink down, all right? With business intelligence, you have to be careful because you got a boatload of data. So you got huge amounts of data. So it is easy to draw all the pretty bar charts and circle charts and whatever charts you could have, and they tell you nothing. They're not helpful at all. In fact, in many cases, they're unhelpful. They're the opposite of helpful, right? So business intelligence ought to be simple. Uh, you have to remember that in the delivery world, you got smart people, but mostly you don't have rocket scientists, right? So if you're going to give the guy who is managing, uh, uh, you know, 50 delivery drivers something business intelligence to work with, you don't want them out there having to write macros. That's not what you want, right? You want something that's simple, it's configured, that looks the same sort of across the board. All right. Once I had my picture drawn, I started trying to figure out how I was going to actually build the technology to do that. The uh, data hub is relatively easy with today's technologies. Uh, you can connect things up. They're relatively easy to connect up, to connect to people. So that's, that's not so bad. Uh, we've been working a long time on the, the route optimizer and we have one that is very good. Uh, geocoding, uh, Google has been a big help with geocoding. Uh, you input an address, and if you live in the United States, you get back a latitude and longitude, which most of the time is in the ballpark. Now, it is not, in many cases, where you actually want to go. It, the, the best geocoding you can get is what they call rooftop geocoding. And a rooftop is just what you think it is. It's the, 
about where they think the building is. But, the, but if you're going to deliver, you're not going to deliver to the rooftop. You're going to deliver to the dock door or you're going to deliver somewhere. So you need to have something which is better than that. It's also the case that there is a small percentage, maybe 5% of the geocodes that are just garbage. You don't notice them much when you have your, you're doing it on your cell phone. But uh, uh, I spent five years working with the post office uh, and I've looked at thousands and thousands of postal routes. And uh, you, you will have some that will geocode in the middle of the streets, uh, some that will geocode, uh, uh, there's the bite of, I've forgotten where the zero zero is. Uh, there's a zero zero latitude and longitude and it takes you this one place in the world. So there's a lot of, the, the data is not, not perfect. So you, there, there's a way to get started but then you have to do something to improve it. If you're in a lot of countries like Panama, Panama, uh, you, you will get about as close as to say you're in Fulton County. Fulton County, not real helpful, right? If you're gonna deliver to Fulton County, that's tough. Uh, the, we, we, we've gotten over the years, we've gotten better and better at both analytics and business intelligence. Easier to do business intelligence, and uh, we have some real capability in, in doing analytics. The, the hard part there is getting it, trying to figure out exactly what analytics you want to do and what business intelligence. Uh, dispatching is always uh, uh, exciting because you don't know exactly what people want to do. Some people want to have different strategies for which truck drivers they want to do things with, but there's a, a part to do that. Uh, there's the part to do monitoring and exception handling, that is look where things are all the time, communicate with the drivers. And then there are mobile assistants, and we have a mobile assistant, we actually have uh, three of them, uh, one for drivers, one for uh, salespeople, and one for merchandisers. They're the people that come along behind and uh, put stuff up. So, we built all of the pieces, right? And so the, the technology is not, uh, I would say, other than the, uh, the route optimizer is not really rocket science. Uh, route optimizer more or less is rocket science, but the rest of it is mostly not. But it is not at all easy to build so that it actually works. One of the hardest parts is, are these mobile assistants uh, you, you've got a, an app that goes on a mobile phone. And a mobile phone's got an operating system. And it doesn't have the same version of the operating system, even if you've got the same brand of mobile phone, right? So they change the operating system, and sometimes they'll do it to you when they change the operating system. All right? and, and particularly if people try to install the apps on old phones. The newer phones, most of the newer phones, uh, we can make work, be pretty sure it's going to work before ever having tested it. But the older ones, uh, maybe not so much, and there are a lot of older phones still out there. Okay? All right. Let's go back to the problem again just for a minute. There are a lot of different flavors of, of delivery problems. And so... When you walk in and somebody says, I have a delivery problem, uh, and you've got technology, that doesn't necessarily mean your technology is going to solve their problem. So you have to sort out what it is that is important about their problem. And the things that matter, uh, the, these are the ones I think matter the most. Probably the, the way they do sales is the thing that makes the most difference. Uh, what is called traditional sales is... Uh, you will uh, send out a sales representative. They'll go to a store. They will take an order. And then either tomorrow or two days from now, they will make the delivery. So you'll have a, a set time when you're going to have to make the delivery. All right? So that's one kind of delivery. And there, the, you want to have, almost always, you want the deliveries to be on a fixed sequence. That is, if they're once a week, you don't want them to be every Monday or every Tuesday or every Wednesday. Mostly your customers don't like one week you come this day and another week you come that day because you have to think about the customer. The customer got to figure out how much to buy. 
right? And they want to buy a week's worth of stuff. And if they don't know if you're going to come back in a week or 10 days, they don't know how much stuff to buy. So if they don't want to run out, they have to buy 10 days. So customers don't like that. E-commerce has created a humongous headache for everybody in the delivery business. Because if you're doing the, the traditional sales, I say, I'm going to go to those people on Monday and those people on Tuesday and those people on Wednesday. And if I'm really tough, I won't let them be delivered except on those days. Now, if they're an important enough customer, they have a lot of what are called off-cycle orders. But mostly what I want to do is I want to balance out the, the work that's going to take place every day. E-commerce, generally, you don't have any idea when people are going to buy. So everybody is going to buy on Monday. What's worse, your sales staff screws up the buying because they'll run uh, Black Friday. You're in the delivery business. You don't like Black Friday. You don't like anything that causes this big spike because if you order it today, they're going to expect it to be delivered at some time in the future. And for all of delivery, this is what you want. This is not what you want, right? Because if you're going to satisfy the customer and you got this, then you're going to have enough, have enough capability to be up here. And that means when you're down here, you're still going to pay for that capability you got up here. Okay? The, the, a vendor manage is the easiest because that says I can send it whenever I want to, right? And then delivery times, delivery anytime, I like that, right? Delivery during delivery windows is the most typical the, and, and the most common delivery windows you have are when the store is open. So, 9 to 5. But that's much better delivering to a store than delivering to an individual. If you're delivering to an individual, they're not open 9 to 5. Right? So, ha what has to happen is you somehow have to have a scheduled delivery if you're going to actually deliver it to the person. So, scheduled deliveries, first, it's harder to solve all of this delivery problem if you have to have schedule, because that says I've got a pretty narrow window. But it's also the case, I've got to work out with the customer when, what that window is going to be, right? Somehow, I've got to say, okay, I'm going to get you to your house between 2 and 3. And you've got to say, yep, I'm going to be there between 2 and 3. So, this one is the hardest when you have scheduled deliveries. In much of the U.S., you, if, if I'm not home, UPS leaves the stuff at the door. If it doesn't say Apple on the front and it's not booze, then they leave it on the door, right? If you're in Panama, nothing is left on the door. Because if you leave it on the door, it simply won't be there, right? So it just doesn't happen. So in many of the developing countries, and also many of the big cities, U.S. big cities, if you have to leave it outside, they just won't do it. Uh, access is a big deal. If there are restrictions on the access, then, uh, you know, restrictions can be like for right now. Uh, Amazon, everybody talks about, oh, Amazon's in the delivery business. But Amazon has a very hard time delivering to me because I have to live in a gated community. And I, if you want to... FedEx can deliver to me because we give FedEx the code to the gate. UPS can deliver to me. You, the post office can deliver to me. Amazon can't deliver to me. Why not? They're not Amazon drivers, right? They're crowdsourcing the drivers. So it can be a different driver every time. So giving Amazon the code is just like I might as well post it on the front gate, right? So uh, any kind of restrictions cause issues. Parking is more and more of a problem. Uh, it, it, people get terribly aggravated about uh, trucks parked on the street. In Panama, the trucks generally are the, the companies allow the drivers to decide what the route is going to be. Now you might think that's a good idea because the drivers should know what the route is going to be. One of the problems with that is the guy who's loading the truck doesn't know what the route's going to be. So the guy loading the truck loads the truck, but he doesn't have it loaded in delivery order. 
So if it's not loaded into delivery order, it takes a guy a lot longer when he arrives there because he's got to find the order. You got to scramble around in the truck where you got, you know, 150 degrees and dark uh, to do it. Uh, Walk-in requirements. More and more, particularly in big cities, you have to park and do some walking. And the more you have to walk, then the more time it's going to take you to do it. Now, all of those things cause your estimates to be different. If I have to walk, if, you, if the, the post office, if they deliver a package to me, they have to walk about 10 feet. I live in Vinings, the streets there, houses there. This is easy, right? But they'll also deliver to somebody that lives 100 yards off the road. And that takes a lot longer. So it's very hard to figure out how long it should take them to do this. The last thing here is one of the, one of the things that is a huge deal, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, is driver familiarity. Uh, if you try to estimate how long it's going to take to find a customer, this is pretty easy to do if the same driver is going there every time and knows what to do. The same with servicing a customer. They're going back to the same place every time. They know what to do. If you send a different driver, then they don't know what to do. So first, it's expensive in terms of it usually takes longer. And it also, you don't know what kind of number to put in there when you're doing the planning. With planning, you'd like to have lots of customers on each route, but not so many that you can't get them delivered and you have to bring the stuff back. So if you have to bring something back, that generally is way more expensive than having left it off altogether. All right. All right. Uh, there's design issues. I guess I better speed up a little. Uh, the, the design issues are, are something that, while we have technology that helps with this, it generally, the company is wise to have uh, some hotshot consulting somebody help them to use the technology to do this. So all you hotshot consulting people can listen up. And, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the first thing is with regard to delivery day assignments. Uh, Truck drivers are typically on salary, and so if they're on salary, that says that, that every day they're going to get paid for eight hours. If you don't send them out, they're still going to get paid for eight hours, right? So if you are very efficient one day and you only need 20 trucks, but the next day you need 40 trucks and you have 40 trucks and drivers on salary, you're going to pay the 40 truck, pay for the 40 trucks and drivers on the day you only need 20, all right? So what that means is that you can't wait, you shouldn't wait, and, and just let your customers decide when they're going to get their delivery. What you want to do is decide when they're going to get their delivery, because if you do that, you can spread it out. So if there's one thing in any, almost any delivery environment, well, you have the capability to do that, the capability to spread it out. You can save more money by spreading it out than you ever could by being more efficient with the route. All right. Having said that, this is not an easy thing to do. First, it's not an easy thing to do because particularly for uh, the ones that are what we call traditional sales, we've got sales reps, because not only do you have to spread it out over the drivers, you also have to have the sales reps have about the same amount of work every day. So the technology is not so easy to do that with. Uh, route strategy. Uh, there's always this debate between dynamic routes and what some people call fixed routes, but what I prefer to talk about is master routes. Dynamic route means it's a route that I have all the data and I now build a route for that data. A master route means I am going to approximate what the routes are going to be like based on past data. So I've got an approximation. Now, the fact that you've got a master route doesn't mean you actually have to run that route. It means you start with that route. All right, so it's today. And now I either am going to start from scratch. That is, I'm just going to pretend I know nothing. 
and build a new route, set of routes, or I'm going to start with a set of master routes, my approximate routes, and try to improve them. If it were the case that I could truly optimize, if what I said right to start was a lie, right, and I really could optimize, it wouldn't matter which one of those things you do. But generally, people have found it easier to start from scratch to get a good solution than to improve the solution. All right. So we've had to work hard on the starting with the master route side. But that clearly is the better way to do it. Almost always, you're better off if you can take advantage of what you know. So you have to have some way of taking advantage of what you've learned. If you're doing dynamic routes every day, you, you have a hard time learning, and then you have a hard time taking advantage of what you've learned. All right? So one of the, the big strategy issues you have is, are you going to do that? The biggest difficulty with master routes is that you have to keep them up. Because having bad master routes is worse than having no routes at all, because that's where you're going to start your optimization. So if you're not going to pay attention, have somebody take care of the master routes, you're better off not to have master routes. Because if you start with a bad master route, the computer is sitting there and it's trying to make that thing better, right? But the worse it is, the more effort it takes to make it better. If you let the computer decide itself what the route's going to be, it can generate a pretty good route. So it can get a pretty good starting place. Now, if you work hard on the master routes, you can get a better starting place, right? Returns and revisits are a huge issue. Uh, with regard to how you're going to deal with them. Returns are expensive. If you try to deliver something and you don't, it's expensive. Because I have made the effort, I have accomplished nothing by it, I've got to bring it back, it has to be processed back at my distribution center, put back in stock, whatever. It's a very expensive operation. So you don't want that to happen. But the question is, how are you going to deal with this? So somebody has to have a strategy for how you're going to deal with it. In some places, uh, they will make, try to make multiple, go multiple times to make the same delivery just because they don't want to bring it back. Okay, master routes. Uh, we got pretty good at master routes. Uh, uh, one of the things that's nice thing, uh, I'll give you my take on, on optimization. Uh, optimization, the algorithms in optimization are mostly pretty limited. Mostly you cannot solve the problems that I want to solve. You cannot solve the delivery problem with a, a sort of off-the-shelf routing algorithm. Having said that, the concepts you can use to solve the problem. All right? So we can go in and do a pretty good job of generating master routes that are reasonably well balanced. Now here, each one of these is a different day. So you break them up by day. And here I've got geographies that, so Monday it's down here, Tuesday it's up there, Wednesday I did it wrong, this, uh, backwards. But uh, this is one day down here. Now, if you're going to let, this, this works fine if you're going to make people adhere to the, the day you've assigned them the delivery. But if you're going to let that guy up at the top order on this day down here, it means you're not going to have, if I do this, I'm not going to have a truck up there. So this is not necessarily the best strategy. Somehow you have to decide, am I going to enforce my delivery days? If I am, it's a good strategy, most efficient. If I'm not, not a good strategy. I'm better off to have trucks going all over the area at the same time. Uh, just, I don't have time to talk about it, but we solve a, a, a relaxation of this problem, and then take the solution and convert it into uh, what you do every day. And uh, we can do some things to match up uh, uh, what we're working on a problem right now where there's a distributor and they distribute uh, Pepsi products, not Pepsi beverage, but Pepsi other products, Gatorade, that sort of thing, and they distribute Coors. And Pepsi and Coors will let them deliver on the same truck, but they won't let them order by the same sales reps. So they send Coors sales reps, they send Pepsi sales reps, 
and they both have to go out there on, say, Monday, and they'll both be delivered on Wednesday. And so now you have to have your delivery routes have to make sense. So you have to assign each one of those customers a delivery day so that you're going to have efficient routes. But then your Pepsi sales reps have to have a pretty nice group of customers to visit, and your core sales reps have to have a pretty nice group of customers to visit. So if you want to look at, for a hard problem for your master's, PhD, whatever, that comes in that category, hard problem. Uh, what data is required? We got uh, the customer data. Uh, you got the geocodes. That is, where are they? You got the stop times. How long are they going to be stopped? You got the delivery windows. When can you deliver to them? You got the delivery restrictions. So uh, this guy's truck can't go in there, right? The drive data, you need drive times and drive distances. So we call them a drive time matrix and a, a, a drive distance matrix. And that's between every pair that you might want to go between. And it's not just us. Everybody in the world who does this has to have that data. Sometimes they approximate it by straight line, great circle miles. And if they do, it almost always will give you garbage. Okay? There's order data. This data is usually pretty good. There's product data. That is pretty good if it's weight. I don't know why volume got put over to the side. It should be this much bigger. Volume is much harder. If they're delivering things like cases, that's OK. You can count those. Uh, if you're delivering a lot of other stuff, it is hard to know how much volume this, this order is going to take up on the truck. There's truck data, driver data, availability, that's usually pretty good. Uh, and then uh, stop data, uh, parking, again, is, is always a problem. So here is the kind of data you have. All right, with regard to stop time data, uh, traditionally what we've done is we've created a, a, an equation that says the stop time is going to be equal to some fixed time plus the amount of stuff you're delivering times some constant. That's what we've done. And you apply that across the board. And for sure, it is going to be really bad for some circumstances. Because often it's the case, particularly if you're delivering to little people, that the fixed cost is a much bigger deal than the variable cost. All right, you have to wait because uh, grandmother's got to uh, uh, check somebody out or whatever. Uh, so uh, what we can do now that is, is much better is we keep up with a, a distribution of stop times for every customer. So every customer's got a distribution, right? So we know what they, what they had delivered. We know how long it took. We know what day it was. We know what time of day it was. So we know all that stuff. And so because you got that, you can make a much, much better estimate. And every time you go out there, you get another piece of data. And so you are continually improving. And if it changes... If something is different, now you know that it's different. So this is one of those things that the computer can keep up with, right? Uh, the, the drive time data is probably the hardest. Uh, you can get uh, drive times and distance matrices, uh, and, and you can get them from Google, Bing, uh, OpenStreets, all of those you can get them from. Uh, the, there's a variety of issues. Uh, one is you can have bad geocodes, and if you have bad geocodes, what has to happen is you got a geocode, and then wherever you get it, somebody has to match the geocode to this underlying street network. All right? It's going, to, it's going to take it, and usually it's going to match that there's an underlying network. It's going to take the geocode, and it's going to try to put it to the closest place. All right? Now, if this is a rooftop geocode, and the closest place happens to be on the other side of the interstate behind the house, it's going to put it there, right? So it's pretty easy to get it screwed up. And it takes pretty good technology to figure out that you've got it screwed up. All right? So you can have a bad network assignment, bad G codes. Uh, drive time is variable, and these companies typically don't tell you when they're, when they're giving you the time for. They don't say, we, we, this, your estimate is uh, uh, 20 minutes to get from here to here, and that will be at 9 o'clock in the morning. All right? So what has to happen is that you have to, if you want to do it well, you have to revise it based on the GPS trail. Now what we can do, got the GPS is on the phone. We're getting a GPS signal every 10 seconds. So we know where the vehicle is. So we know how long it took to go from A to B for any A and B you want to have. 
Here I've color coded them, so the yellow ones are 40 to 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. So I can figure out what the time is. And then again, I just do the same thing. It's more complicated, but the same thing I was doing with the stop times. So I've got samples. If you're using master routes, this is much better because a master route will tend to take you along the route about the same time every day. And if it's about the same same time every day, you're going to be much better at estimating. Mostly, what you want to do is you would like to take out the variability and uncertainty. You'd like to make it go away. So the more you can do that, almost always, the better off you are. The idea that you can take advantage of sort of knowledge about the order and that's going to do better, almost always that's wrong. Uh, route optimization, we have a very good optimizer. Uh, we can do dynamic routes if that's what somebody wants to do, and in some cases uh, that is the thing to do, or we can generate master routes and then improve the master routes, right? Biggest problem you have with the route optimizer is these things will work pretty well as long as you don't get too many customers in a route. Uh, it's making lots and lots of, looking at lots and lots of different solutions. And if it's looking at a solution that has lots of customers in the route, then it takes it a while, even if it's using a heuristic, which it is, to solve the traveling salesman problem. And if you're, it doesn't matter if you're only solving one. I mean, you know, it takes a second. But if I want to solve a million, right? Now, a second's a long time. So I've got to do better than that. So there are still some issues with that. Uh, once we have the master route or we've got the, the, uh, the optimization engine set up, then it, it should not be the case that anybody has to do anything to it. Now, this is a concept that uh, John and I tried quite a few years ago. We weren't smart enough then to make it work, but now we can actually make it work. Uh, the thing is that what you've got to do is if, it, if you did something wrong today, then you've got to figure out what you did wrong today, and then you've got to make a correction in the, in the way the algorithms work, rather than try to correct the route. So you just have to say, OK, that route was messed up. It's probably the case that nobody's smart enough to figure out exactly that it was messed up before it left anyway. The mobile platforms have gotten better. One of the problems is they're too easy to build. So a lot of people have built them. And now somebody's got one, and they want to use their platform. The problem is it's, it's easier and cheaper for me to provide the platform than it is for me to try to hook up with whatever platform they've got to get the data. All right. Well, what they do is they can capture the GPS trails. They can capture reasons for returns. What you'd like to do is not have returns. If you want to not have returns, you need to figure out what's causing the returns. All right. Uh, they can capture reasons for no sales. Uh, in a lot of cases, salespeople go out, they have a, a group of customers they're supposed to visit, but they may not visit those customers, especially if they run out of time. Their tendency is to go to the ones that they can sell the most to. So the guy they can't sell very much to may not get a call, and if they don't get a call, ultimately you lose that guy. Uh, they can provide real-time visibility and you can provide all kinds of alerts to drivers, salespeople, customers, that sort of thing. All of that's easy. We can do that now. Uh, just to give you an idea, these are just things off the phone. Uh, basically, what the phone does is you download the order uh, in delivery order. So there they are. Now, you pick one. You say, okay, I'm going to pick the first one. I, think that, I don't know if that's the one I picked if they were there. Anyway, you pick one. And now then you say, okay, uh, there's some choices. Uh, maybe I want driving directions. If you say I want driving directions, what it does is just go to whatever app you have on your phone. So if you use Google or Waze or whatever, it just takes you there, puts in the latitude and longitude so you don't have to do that, and then you get driving directions, right? If you know how to get there, you go ahead and get there. If you get there and it's closed, then you skip it, or whatever reason. If you say you're going to skip it, then you have to say why you skipped it, all right? Because all that information is kept. When you get there, uh, you indicate that you've, you've arrived. Uh, many, many, many companies uh, capture the time taken for the delivery from when the, when the driver says I arrived and when the driver says I departed. If you did that, you almost always have bad data because drivers forget. Uh, they don't do it at the right place. Uh, sometimes they don't even do it at the store they're supposed to be at. All right? So, 
what this hopefully does is gives you an indication of where they are. The GPS trail, you know where they are geographically, but you don't know which store they're at, right? So then uh, when you get there, uh, you can uh, either put in more information or if, you've, if there's some reason that there's some problem, you can specify what it is. Uh, we've tried doing things like letting them put notes in. That turns out to be a bad idea for two reasons. One is uh, that they usually put a lot of things in, particularly when they're unhappy. And uh, so it takes somebody a lot of work to figure out what they've said. So it works usually out better if you have defined pretty carefully what it is you want to do. Uh, uh, this is, this is uh, why they didn't, oh, uh, the, you, you, on the phone you can you indicate what was delivered and what wasn't delivered. It can, it can calculate what the, what the cost is. Uh, it totals it up. It keeps up with it. Uh, if, it didn't, if there's anything it didn't take in the order, you can specify why it wasn't taken. So somebody can figure out what the problem was, uh, particularly if it's something like an order picking issue or something like that. Uh, can't tell what that one is. Oh. This is the same thing for sales. So uh, the salespeople typically, they'll take one. And so if they go to some place and they don't get a sales order, then they have to indicate why. All right, visibility. We can, anytime, you can look and you can see where everybody is. You can see how much they've got left on their, their route. So this one's about 56% done. I can look and see where they are. I can look and see how much time they've spent at every place so far. So I can see where they are. It's pretty. Not that useful, but pretty. Right? The, the data is much more useful when it's accumulated and then you do some analytics on it later. Occasionally, they run into a problem that somebody can help them with. Uh, what we found is that not many people want to look at this all the time, so we define what it is that they believe to be a problem. They've been stopped too long in one place or they're more than 10 minutes late. And so the manager gets sent uh, uh, an alert. So it goes on to another app. Uh, every time you go out, uh, when they make the delivery, if they indicate it on the phone, we try to match it up with where they actually made the stop. So you've got a GPS indication that you made a stop. And hopefully, you've got at least one point on the phone in that time frame when they hit the button. If they did that, now I can match them up and say, OK. They were at this location, I know it's this location, and so now I have one more sample of the latitude and longitude. Latitude and longitude, the, there is error associated with latitude and longitude, so the more samples you get, the better your estimate of what it is. The circle you see here is how good we believe it is. So every time we get another sample, we squeeze down the, the circle, all right? And then when it gets good enough, we say, ah, that's where it was instead of where we thought it was. We thought it was over here, but that's where it really is. Uh, we do something very similar with the stop times and drive times. Uh, analytics, uh, like I said, the problem now is mostly you got too much rather than too little. Uh, the same uh, analytics are used to make business decisions and provide business insights, but you also use this to try to figure out how you're going to do better the next time. And we got a lot smarter about what we do. So, uh, key features, sort of, of, the, of this new generation of stuff. You can optimize the sales territories, the delivery days. You can balance the workloads. Uh, you can look at alternate delivery strategies. Uh, you can automatically uh, optimize the routes. You can use either master routes or dynamic routes. You can monitor the status of the drivers. Uh, you can provide business intelligence about all this stuff. You can send alerts to anybody that you want to. Uh, you can clean the data. So there's a lot of tools associated with just making the data work. Uh, and so everything is sort of in one spot, and it all connects together. All right? Maybe that's the biggest deal, is it all connects together. So all it has to do is you have to have, there's APIs that connect, use to connect to the company. So uh, you've got to get data from the company every day about what is going to, what 
be delivered that day. And then at the end of the day, they have to get the data back about what actually was delivered that day so they can reconcile. And then everything in the middle uh, is handled sort of away from the company. So that's the only connection it has to have. Uh, there's other ways to do it, but that's the cleanest way. Now you can ask your question if you want to. Yes, John. John, can you talk a little bit about big data and uh, being able to use big, you know, like a thousand CPUs at once, like in, in, in uh, you know, Microsoft Azure, uh, versus in the past where we had a huge enemy of probes, right? It's like 4,300 to 1 huge advantage. Do you have that kind of big, big iron doing all these maps? We, 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 use, we use the big iron to, to do the enumeration. And we, we use it for some of the data. GPS data, you end up with a tremendous amount of data because you're getting a, 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 a latitude and longitude every 10 seconds from every truck, right? And so you get a huge amount of data. Uh, the, uh, the, the thing is, you don't have to have, you, you can, but you don't have to have uh, so much power uh, because you have time to do the processing. So I can process it overnight. It doesn't, you know, the only thing that, that I've got to process quickly is to generate the routes. I have to process that quickly. And so there we, you do need big iron and you need a lot of smarts in the algorithm. Uh, other than that, uh, even for the, the, uh, the GPS on the phones, uh, the, it takes very little data to do it. As long as you stay away from the maps. The maps will chew up a lot of data, but just, just sending the, the GPS coordinate is insignificant. It doesn't, doesn't take much volume of data. And then you're not doing anything with it except just looking at where they are at the time. You're capturing it, but you're looking at where they are. So uh, it is certainly there are, uh, as you get more and more data stored, then it's more and more of a problem. Uh, there's a big problem with uh, business intelligence because the, the customer can reach and get, uh, you know, a year's worth of data when you have a bunch of data. So we restrict how much they can get just because it gets all choked down once you get lots of data just getting it to you. Yeah. Have you been able to quantify the business benefit of being able to automate uh, geo, uh, geoplaning that you can do for stop time distributions, which are, uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, how problematic that is? We, we haven't tried real hard. I mean, it obviously is, is difficult to quantify. One of the biggest problems is, you know, most delivery systems are currently not managed. So if you ask the question of how much is it worth to me to have a managed system versus an unmanaged system, it's, a, it's a not an easy thing to do. We do quantify things like, uh, what is the direct delivery cost? So we keep direct delivery cost for every customer. For every customer, we do that. Now, uh, that, but we don't keep up. That, that's just what it costs for that truck to go out and deliver to that customer. Uh, in addition to that, there's if any trucks were idle, that's not counted in there. And returns, it's very hard to put any kind of number on returns. Uh, if you go out and look at any return operation, uh, you can see that it is atrociously expensive. And uh, th there's a lot of uh, uh, loss in the returns. A lot of the returns don't get returned is part of the problem. Uh, but uh, no, it's, it, is, it is very, very difficult to quantify. Uh, it's also, in some cases, hard to get people to admit that their current system doesn't work very well, as you know. Uh, I believe there are very, very few uh, delivery systems where uh, the technology and concepts are working very well. And so I think it's going to take a, a different generation of technology, but it's also going to take uh, uh, people who know what to do with the technology. And like I said, most companies I don't think do. Yes, sir. Would, would deal with what? Well, say if there's a major accident, or a bridge goes down, or whatever, and, and 
Yeah, uh, that, is, that is the one thing that uh, monitoring can do. Because uh, the guys back at the distribution center, uh, wherever the control tower is, and control tower can be just one room or it can be a thing the size of this. But uh, they know that the bridge is out or there's been a big accident or whatever. So they can notify all of their, the, the drivers that that is the case. And they can try to either give them advice or tell them to look on Waze and Google, or Google to try to get advice. Uh, there, there's still a problem with Waze and Google in that they are geared for uh, cars. And so uh, you have some difficulties if cars and trucks uh, are not allowed on the same, same street. So you have bigger difficulties. Uh, there's a bridge in Panama that the uh, trucks can't go across during the daytime, so they have to get over there real early in the morning or, and, and get back later at night. So uh, there are some, some issues with that. But I think, again, uh, it, there are a few dynamics like that, sort of things that instantaneously come up that you have to deal with. But if you wanted to look at how you wanted to run a better delivery operation, it wouldn't be, I think, usually to handle those things better. Uh, the, the thing in delivery is you are just sending out a bunch of stuff. You're making a bunch of deliveries. So if you can save, uh, you know, 50 cents per delivery, you can save a huge amount of money. And uh, the, the delivery is, is that one point where most companies, maybe the only point where they actually interface with the customer. And if they screw it up, the customer is going to be very unhappy about it, unhappy enough to lose the customer a lot of times. So I, I think that uh, the, I would advise anybody in a, that's trying to run a delivery system to try to make all of the, the, the sort of bread and butter ones work. <laughs> make, make all of those where, uh, you know, Try, try to eliminate as much variability and uncertainty as you can, even if you're going to pay a little extra for it. You're going to have to uh, not be quite as efficient. To try not to introduce yourself, variability and uncertainty, which is going to cause a problem with the customer and it causes a problem with your planners. So, bad enough when it happens and you can't do anything about it, but you shouldn't do it to yourself, usually. Uh, well, the the thing you, the the problem you have with geocodes is e even the the lo your delivery location doesn't necessarily stay the same, right? I mean, you, it, it, at one time we were happy if we could just get within a block or two, but now you know if you're if you're trying to make fifty or sixty deliveries a day, you just can't waste time looking for it. So if, if it's got to be at the back door, you got to go to the back door. And if they change it, now it's going to be at the front door, you got to go to the front door, right? So you have to keep looking at your samples and see if they jive with where you, you think the thing was. And, you know, as soon as you, you, you have to say, okay, I'm getting these new samples now, are they consistently at a different location? If they are, you got, you've either got to call the people and say, have you changed what we're doing? You got to talk to your drivers, you have to do something. So the, the, the biggest difficulty is trying to figure out if there's change. Now, you don't have to have a geofence. People talk about geofences, and, and they're pretty. I mean, geofence, all that means is you're going, uh, here's the point. Now I'm going to draw a fence around the point, and then I'm going to figure out if they go across the fence. But the simpler thing to do is just say how far I am from the point. You know, I know here's the street, right? I don't have to have a fence. If, I'm, if I do the geofence, somebody has to fence it. Somebody, and you have to think that uh, a moderate size, we work with a moderate size company in, in Panama, and they have 13,000 customers that they visit. Uh, 13,000 geofences take some time to geofence 13,000, right? So uh, any, anything where uh, on, the, on the planning side, where you're introducing something that people have to do, uh, it, you try to stay away from that. You don't want to do that. Automation. We, we would like to have the whole process automated. And I mean, basically, when, you, when people talk about digital transformation, 
you know, that you, you could say automation is what we're trying to do. We're trying to automate stuff. And the transformation for a lot of what we do is translating something in somebody's head onto something the computer can understand. Uh, post office. I worked with the post office for the last five years. The post office doesn't know where any of the, the locations of mailboxes are. The computer doesn't know your, your house. They don't know where your mailbox is, right? Uh, they don't know where your door is. Uh, so uh, the, the, the question of how you can get that from the, the delivery guy's head into the computer is not a trivial matter. But that's one of the things we're digitizing. Yes? Yes, drivers, don't, it is absolutely the case that drivers do not want to, to do this. Drivers have spent a long time doing whatever they wanted to. Uh, we have one client, and uh, I was looking, we, we put it, first, it depends on where you are. If you're in the U.S., uh, this is negotiated. If you're in Panama, there's no negotiation about this. This is, they, they say, you, you're going to drive it, or, you know, you're not going to work for me tomorrow. That's sort of the way it works. Uh, but we... Uh, we put the, the, the mobile phone app out, and then I'm trying to look at the results, and I notice that all the trucks go to the same area. They, they, they try to beat traffic, Panama City traffic, Panama City, Panama. Traffic is very bad, and they, they get the trucks out early to beat the traffic. And so I look, and all the trucks are going to the same location first. So they go to this location, they stay here an hour, and now there's traffic everywhere, and now they go out somewhere else. And it's the best breakfast spot in Panama, right? So uh, drivers have been used to that sort of thing. When, when, when the, that's one thing that all of the monitoring does, is it does stop a lot of that. Uh, to start with, we were having uh, about uh, from an hour to two hours of what we call unidentified stop time. That means we know the Jeep from the GPS it stopped. We just don't know what it stopped for, right? Because we don't have anything we can match, can match it to. And now uh, the average unidentified stop for the same company, same drivers, is 30 minutes. And 30 minutes is what they gave them for lunch. So they can stop anywhere they want to for 30 minutes. So they don't like it. And I, I'm not, that's not my business. It's the company that's going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, we tr one of the things we try to do is tell the monitors to, to not get too uh, overbearing. Uh, sometimes they'll, you know, the driver will have been at a stop for 20 minutes and they want to call them to find out why they're stopped for 20 minutes. And, but there may be very good reasons why the driver is stopped there for 20 minutes, particularly if it's a customer. You know, they have to wait, they have to do whatever. But no, they're not crazy about it. Salespeople like it even less. Uh, the sales, for everybody, you try to provide something that is helpful to them. Uh, one of the things we found that the drivers uh, didn't like at all was that when they got back in the evening, uh, they had to uh, reconcile. They had to bring the stuff back. They, they, in Panama, they, they pay cash. So almost everything is a cash deal. They have to bring the money back, and they have to bring back what they didn't deliver. And then they have to reconcile. And the problem was that they came back at odd times, and sometimes there wouldn't be anybody there for them to reconcile with. So they just have to sit there and wait until they reconcile. Now, uh, the boss man tells the people doing the reconciliation, you can see where they are. So when they get to the door, there better be somebody there to reconcile. They don't have to wait. For the salespeople, uh, the salespeople, Sales people, John's a sales guy. You know, he, he, sales people are very cranky about being observed. But they, they, uh, one one of the things that we provide to them is on the mobile app. Uh, they have when they go to a customer, they can see if the customer rejected something from the last order. And a lot of times, the customer's reason for rejection, they have to say why they rejected it if it if it turned it down. And a lot of times, they say they didn't order it. So now the salesperson is sitting there. And they say, oh, last time they rejected this, and they said they didn't order it. But, you know, I know they ordered it, so i got to work it out with the salespeople. So they like that part. Uh, they also like the part that uh, uh, you know, salespeople uh, are often assigned uh, 
far more customers than they can go visit. They don't go visit them because they can't. You know, they give you 60 stores to go take orders in today. You take orders in 60 stores. And so by having the technology, you can see what they did. You can see how long it is. Uh, nobody had any idea how long it took a salesperson. So somehow it has to be some advantage for them or they complain a lot. And then it's up to management to deal with. We, well, all we try to do is to make it as attractive as we can make it. I am. Please join me in thanking Dr. Ratliff.